dramas, podcasts and documentaries are more popular than ever. But for our next guest, coming face to face with dangerous criminals, murderers and psychopaths isn't entertainment, it's his job. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr Sean Das is a forensic psychiatrist who spent his uh, career getting inside the mind of killers. Now he's written down some of his more incredible encounters in a new book and he joins us now. Morning. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. So, real-life forensic uh, psychiatrist, tell us exactly what that means and what it is you do. Sure. So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who deals with mental illness and a forensic psychiatrist does that, but specifically with offenders or people that have committed high levels of violence. So if I was going to break it down, I'd say there's kind of two areas of my job. There's the area of acting as an expert witness. Mm -hmm. So I assess people who've committed a serious crime that might yeah. be in remand. I make comments um, on criminal responsibility, whether they're mentally ill or not, whether they need to go to hospital or prison. And then the other side is once they've gone through that process, the small proportion that need long-term rehabilitation and need treatment for their mental illnesses, I help that process and help make them safe to be released into society. Because I don't want to sound like a bleeding heart liberal or anything, but apart from a crime of passion, it would strike me that anyone who would kill in cold blood would be mentally ill. But is that not the case? Well, good question. So I suppose that depends on how you define mental illness, right. Then, right? So if you define it as something very extreme that's filled with hate that most average people wouldn't do, then yes, it would fit into that category. But a psychiatrist would define it as somebody that has a diagnosable mental illness. So schizophrenia, for example, would be a typical presentation. So somebody that's like hearing voices that are compelling them to act violently, or they have paranoid delusions, uh, which cause them to act out sort of preemptively, violently. So that would be the typical kind of case. And that's the difference between whether someone goes to prison prison or goes to a, a, an institution that, that, that deals with people like, you know, who are mentally ill. Exactly. So crimes. there needs to be symptoms, there needs to be a mental illness to treat. That's the whole rationale of diverting them to these secure units in the first place. Yeah. As a nation, we have this appetite for m those murderer yeah. documentaries, podcasts and things like that. Did you have that same appetite and is that how you fell into this line of work? I've got to be honest, I kind of stumbled into forensic psychiatry. Did you? Yeah, yeah I, think, you? I, think, uh, I think I was always interested in criminality. So as a kid, I'd listen to gangster rap, you know, NWA, Snoop Dogg. I used yeah. to watch all these mob films. But I didn't realise back then that there was an opportunity to do that as a career. And then I kind of did, did medicine. I, I kind of struggled through my university career, just about passed exams, maybe took the socialising a bit too seriously, didn't concentrate on studying, and, and I never really felt inspired until I did a psychiatry placement. And then, unbeknownst to me, I just clicked with it. You just uh, loved it. Yeah, just the people, that the stories were so fascinating, stepping into the world of people that had these really sort of strange delusional beliefs or were at the lowest ebb, like post-suicide attempts, et cetera, et cetera. And then forensics specifically is fascinating to me because there's always a backstory. There's always a reason why somebody has uh, followed a life of repeated criminality or ended up with a mental illness. And it's often the same confounding factors. It's often poverty, drug abuse, witnessing domestic violence, all these kind of things. So tell us about the, like, what prompted you to, to write the book and, and what's in it? What's... So I'd say it's about 10% my own ego and uh, trying to show off a little bit. <laughs> uh, but I think it's mainly because I have all these stories. I, I've, I've seen patients that have done, you know, unmentionable things, things that I couldn't talk about uh, on morning TV without making your, your viewers um, being sick on their porridge. But I, I just thought there's a big thirst out there for it. So I wanted to, to demystify some of the myths. And also I wanted to focus on the rehabilitation as well. I think, as you mentioned before, Alison, everyone's interested in the, in the lurid details and the, yeah. you know, the big murders, but part of the process is to make people safer and to rehabilitate them. And I think the stories in my book show that people can change and they can be cured and they can be released and be safe to live fulfilling lives in society. The thing is, you're coming face to face with murderers, killers. Uh, do you ever feel scared? I know on your first meet, your first day of this job, you actually got punched in the face, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So I, I want to make it really clear that I don't want to add to the stigma that people with mental illnesses are dangerous yeah. because the vast majority of them aren't. It just happens to be the ones that I see as a forensic psychiatrist mm. go through the criminal <clears> justice <throat> system. Um, having said all that, I didn't help that stigma by, by getting punched in the face on my first day on a secure unit, yeah. So what but, happened? Was it just a random attack? Yeah, absolutely. So the person, the uh, perpetrator of somebody that I didn't know, had never spoken to before, I was actually on the ward assessing somebody else. Yeah and he had these delusional beliefs about me. So he believed that I was somebody from his past, the previous bully in disguise. So he just ran up and kind of punched me on the side of the head. Oh my God. Gotta be honest, it wasn't actually really that traumatic for me because there was no build-up of tension or threat. It just happened right. out of the blue. I lost consciousness and I kind of woke up on the floor and, and it was over before it kind yeah. of started. But to answer your previous question, generally speaking, 
the defendants are on their best behaviour when I assess them, because no matter how antisocial or hostile they might be in real life, they know that I'm writing a report that's going to go to the judge. Does that make it harder to assess them? Because no. they're on their best behaviour, you have to get past that, don't you, yeah. to see who the person really is? Yeah, 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 but I I'd be eliciting more of their actual symptoms of mental illness, so the things oh, I was talking I about before, hearing voices, etc. Plus, crucially, you don't just take the word of the defendant in front of you, you have to do, look at all the evidence, so, you know, case papers, police interviews, CCTV, etc., right, okay. etc. Et yeah. What makes, what do you think makes a killer? There's a, there's, <clears throat> we have to sort of differentiate a psychopath to a killer here, isn't it? I mean, it, yep. like, there's, I mean, I remember that John Ronson book and I, when I read, like, the psychopath test and the, the psychopath test that worked out that, like, 4 to 12% of CEOs, oh, you could say, are psychopaths. Yeah, yeah but, but they that's... don't necessarily kill people. Exactly, they're like yeah. psychopaths. So I think the term psychopathy is often misunderstood and it's kind of used colloquially to anybody who's acting violently, but as you say, Dermot, it's, it's much more than that. So a true psychopath can be impulsive, they can sometimes be aggressive, but most importantly, they're manipulative and they can be quite charming, they can be quite deceitful. So as you say, like CEOs, or in the, in the corporate world, they tend to do quite well. And the reason is, is because they'll do anything to get a promotion. They will stab somebody in the back, wow. they will tell lies, they will manipulate. I'm sure we've probably all worked with or know people like that who are quite manipulative in their personality. So yeah, that's, that's more of a psychopath than a typical killer. So what are the traits for, for, for killers? Like, you know, what do you normally look for? Uh, that's quite a broad question. Yeah. I suppose if I had to summarise, there's, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum. So the people that I tend to see, particularly that get sectioned to these forensic units, they tend to have th uh, their, their offences, including murder, are driven directly by symptoms of mental illness. So in theory, they're quite easy to treat and rehabilitate, right? So if you get the right medication, you get rid of the symptoms, then in theory, they're, they're safe. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you get people who are much more antisocial in their personality. Uh -huh. So that's not a mental illness. It's not a, a different state of mind. It's actually in them. It's like ingrained into the character. And how much of that do you think, like, is nature nurture? Like, is, is, is everyone product of the environment, or are there just some people that are chemically just imbalanced and it just, there's nothing they can do about it? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both, Dermot. So I think there are definitely traits that run in families, anything from aggression to impulsivity. Wow. But to me, the more important or the more interesting aspect is the nurture. So, as I was saying before, I think almost <coughs> every single defendant I assess has some sort of story in their background, some sort of trauma. You know, it could be really abusive parents, it could be being bullied at school. There's some kind of reason that they have this right. inferiority complex and, and, it, and it, it grows like a cancer and it becomes part of their aggressive personality. Do you have empathy actually. for them sometimes? Um, yes. I think when I carry out my work, Sometimes I see people that have committed quite horrific offences, you know, killing strangers, different forms of abuse against children. But a couple of things. First of all, I'm very, very clear in my mind what my role is. And my role is never to judge them. Yeah, yeah. there's a whole criminal justice system there, judges, juries, mm. that has to do that. My role is, is only to decide whether they've got a mental illness. If so, did they have symptoms? And if so, were they criminally um, responsible or not? and whether they should go to hospital or prison. So because I'm very clear of that in my mind, I, I try my best to take judgment out of the situation. That doesn't mean I don't have my own thoughts, yeah, but yeah, I take yeah. it out. And the other, thing, the other thing I'd like to say is that almost every perpetrator is in some way a victim or has been a victim at some point. So it's easy to judge the person in front of sure. you that's done something horrible, but if you take it back, at one point they were a vulnerable, potentially helpless child or adolescent. Oh my gosh, Sean, we could speak to you all, all day. day about this. You've it's got a YouTube involved. channel as well before we let you go, dissecting mental health issues called uh, Psych for Sore Minds. So what kind of stuff do you, do you upload? So Psych for Sore Minds, I put, uh, release a couple of videos a week, so it's everything to do with true crime and its intersection with mental illness. Oh, great. So sometimes I look at high-profile cases, sometimes I look at celebrity cases like uh, Jimmy Savile or R. Kelly recently, and I kind of look what I think are the individual character traits or the situations that put them in their situation. Yeah. Amazing. Shaham, uh, Into Minds is out now. Thank you so much Thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much. Absolute Absolutely pleasure. amazing. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you.